Amen. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that we can be together. I'm glad that we can come into this house and, uh, and worship the Lord. And I'm glad that every time we come, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit in this place. Amen. In fact, there's a lot of people that I know of that I've been talking to that they've been saying that they've been waking up in the middle of the night. They've been getting up at 3.30 in the morning. They've been getting up at 4 or 5.30 in the morning. And they're just starting to pray. They can't sleep anymore. You know, what's going on? I believe there's a global awakening, you know, a global awakening where God's not allowing people to stay in their slumber and their sleep and whatever else. It's time to arise, amen, as children of Zion. It's time to, to stand up and to be what God has, has called us to be in this hour. And there's nothing more exciting than Jesus is coming, amen? I believe Jesus is, his coming is imminent and he's, he's about to return. And, and I just want to preach a little bit uh, shortly to you guys this morning, hopefully in the name of Jesus. And I want to just ask you guys to agree with me in prayer as this message goes to your home or you may see this uh, a week from now. You know, you may see this on social media a week from now, but I tell you what, uh, I pray that this message would touch you and encourage you to know what Christ has done. Amen. And so praise the name. If you just bow your heads with me and your hearts with me, Father God, right now, Lord, and into the homes, Father, right now of the people we know and love. Father God, you've allowed us to, to speak, Lord God, into their hearts and lives today. And I pray, Father God, that you would anoint us, Lord Jesus, to do what you've called us to do, and that's to preach this gospel to the ends of the earth, and then the end shall come. Father God, bless each and every heart and every home. Remove fear, Lord Jesus, Father God, from families, Lord God. And Father, as they're tucked away in their own homes this morning, Lord God, as the snow falls in Nebraska, Father God, I just pray, Father God, there would be a warmth in their heart, Lord Jesus. And Father God, every single soul would be just one and brought closer to the Lord. That is our prayer in this ministry, Lord God, that souls would be added to the kingdom. And everybody agreed on that. Amen. And said amen. Praise God. I'm going to talk about Jesus today. Let me know if this mic is hot or not, or if it's good for uh, recording back there. Praise God. But Jesus and the power of his resurrection. What better thing could we talk about this morning than Jesus and the power of the resurrection? And wherever you guys are at, whatever's going on in your life, I want you guys to know that uh, we have some downs every once in a while, but Jesus is always up, okay? He's always up or he's, he, he's always up or he's getting up one or the other. You guys will see it in scripture today. Jesus never stayed down. Look at this. Jesus got up. Jesus got out of that tomb. Amen. Jesus is risen today. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And Jesus wants to come in to you and to touch your life today. And if he got up and if he got out, then he comes in. And when he comes in, you can't stay down. Maybe I should say that again, okay? Jesus got up and Jesus got out of the tomb. And Jesus wants to, to come into your life, okay? And he got up and he got out. And when he comes in, then you can't stay down. Do you get that? When Jesus comes in, you can't stay down. Okay, I don't know. I'm just wanting to see if everybody's awake this morning. Amen. Praise God. Why don't we all just give the Lord a hand clap just to start out again. Now listen, if Jesus is alive, then turn to your neighbor, which are very few in here, and tell somebody that Jesus is alive. Amen. Now, amen. Even you guys at home, you guys be doing this. You guys got to enter in. Amen. Okay. Now everybody has a down day. Everybody has down days, but even Jesus, even Jesus, he was down how many days? He was down three days, right? But it don't count Jesus out. But in Christ, you're, you're not supposed to stay down. And when Jesus comes in, you won't stay down. You can't stay down. You'll have to get up. You have to get up by a resurrection power. And you have to come out because when he's talking to you, you begin to move. Amen? And God is always taking us someplace. If you look at Jesus' earthly ministry, he was always on the move. He didn't stop in one place. He was always on the move. I told this to my wife yesterday. I said, Jesus was never running like we are, okay? But he was always in perfect cadence. He was always in a perfect cadence. You never hear in the Bible where Jesus ran. The disciples ran to get to the tomb that morning, right? And I believe John outran Peter, right? You guys remember that story? But Jesus never ran. He was in perfect sequence, in perfect timing, and in the Lord's will. Amen. But I believe we need to understand that when he gets up, he exhausted sin's power to dominate us. When Jesus got up in the resurrection power, he defeated death's terror to hold us at bay, he, and he, he crushed fear. And so we don't have to be afraid of anything anymore. Do you realize that? That Christ's power makes us free from sin. Amen. Hallelujah. 
I'm not afraid of dying and I'm not afraid of truly living. What I'm more afraid of is not truly living for God, not truly being caught and, and filled with his power and, and used by God on this earth. Wouldn't that be the worst thing that we could ever do? That's the only thing I fear is not being given to God as much as I should be. I don't want to be afraid of anything in this life because nothing the Bible says can separate us from the love of God. Jesus got up, Jesus got out, and when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and when you start to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, he gets into you. And then the one that said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you comes in and he makes everything all right, amen? He's gonna be there for us in times of trial, in times of heartache, in times of, of COVID-19 or whatever's facing the earth today. God is bigger than that. And the message of the cross and the message of the resurrection, I wanna tell you today about what Jesus did and what he accomplished for us. I want you guys to know that Calvary is God's divine reach out to you. Calvary from the cross is God's divine reach. I want you guys to know, some of, some of you guys have given up on the church. Some of you guys have given up on, on, on Jesus, on God. But God's not given up on you and he still wants you. I want you guys to know that he still wants you. No matter what you've done in your life, before Christianity or after Christianity, Jesus still wants you. And God's plan, God's plan, and, and Calvary speaks of it with open arms, amen, is that he's interested in you. He's interested in changing your life. He's interested in giving you a purpose and a plan. He's interested in you taking part of, of this ministry. I would have never seen, Sister, Sister Stephanie, I would have never thought that when I was in my lost state that I could be used for God to minister this gospel, to even pick up a Bible, and yet Jesus Christ has put one, and he's put it like a fire in my belly to be able to preach this gospel, and he's given us opportunity to tell thousands by radio earlier this morning, and maybe thousands even by social media today, amen? God's a good God, and he explodes the resources of, of the unlikely right? And he gives us grace and he allows us to be used in, in a positive way for his glory. Amen. So there's, so there's nothing like Jesus and what he can do in the human heart. I love Jesus today. And I just want to say that we've got a message for Satan and, and Satan, you can't have these people. Amen. Jesus stood in, in the way so you can't have these people. And I thank God for the cross and what it stands for. <clears throat> Death now to us is just an incident. Just an incident, just a fact of life. 10 out of 10 people die and we're gonna move, but death to the Christian is just advancement and it's promotion from on high, amen? We get to go where he is, amen? He's ready, he's there to embrace us, praise God. I want you guys to see this because your God is not in the tomb anymore. He didn't stay there very long. He stayed there three days and then he got up and got out of that place and in Ephesians 4, 8, Ephesians 4, 8, I'll give you a scripture and teach on it just a little bit this morning. Ephesians 4 8 says this when you're there at home we want to hear you at home now come on everybody when you're there say amen and wave, wave your hands amen you guys can do that here too when you're there say amen Therefore, when he ascended up on high, now Jesus came from the belly of the earth, right? He led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. What is that scripture speaking of? It says that Jesus went down. I want to talk to you guys about what Jesus did. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Did you know Jesus was seen, amen, all over the earth for 40 days? He was resurrected from the dead, and it said in Jerusalem that people came physically out of the grave. Amen. Did you guys know that? Did you guys know that when Jesus was resurrected, he, he not only went into the bowels of, of paradise and led captivity captive, but there was a place called Parad paradise where all the faithful believers were kept at that time. And that's where, where Jesus went. He took the keys from, from Satan because he defeated him and pulled off the greatest upset of all time. He defeated Satan at the cross by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Bringing his body and his flesh to death was the key that opened the door. The blood of Jesus that ran down 
down that cross for you and me, set every single one of us free. And though the devil thought that he had won, he hadn't won anything. Amen. Because Jesus, it says in the book of Colossians, made a triumph over him openly, spoiling principalities and powers. Amen. And Jesus wasn't done when he gave up the ghost. At that point, he came a little farther. He went down into the belly of the earth and he took the keys from the devil. Now, Jesus had all authority. He opened up paradise. Amen. And everybody then from Abel all the way to the time where Jesus had died to the thief on the cross. Everybody. Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Now he had opened up the threshold. Amen. In paradise and opened that door. He led captivity captive, all the faithful from the beginning to, to Jesus at that point. And he gave gifts to men. In fact, they, they, were, they were seen seen by, by proofs all over Jerusalem. And we have proofs of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I could give you 21 proofs right now from your scripture. Behold, my hands and my feet, Jesus speaking, amen, look at me. It's I, myself, not another, not a different person. He says, handle me and see me in Luke 24. He, <laughs> amen, he, he showed them his hands and his feet. He took fish and honeycomb and did eat before them in a resurrected body. He was risen. What was risen? His soul and his spirit, hallelujah, were risen. My God, he, they went in, into that hell, into the hell, I'm calling it paradise to preach and to carry on this work. And they set those people free. Every single one that had ever put faith and trust in Jesus. And they came up out of the grave. That was the first resurrection. Isn't that interesting? My God, do you believe in the resurrection out there today? Do you believe in the power of Jesus to lift the power of the Holy Spirit to quicken our mortal bodies? Well, it's important because if you don't believe in the resurrection, how can you believe in the rapture? Seriously, you think about it. Hallelujah. Three things that Christ did in his ascension. He liberated the righteous souls from captivity in the lower parts of the earth. He took these captives to heaven upon his ascension. He gave gifts to men. He left people that are gifted in ministry, and he planted them in time and eternity for people to come out and for people to lead his church all the way home. Isn't that interesting that your gifts and your callings are without repentance today? And the gifts that God placed in his body are perfect for the body in which he's called them to. Amen. Can, it, can we get an amen on that now? Your giftings were placed in you by God. He gave gifts to men. Amen. To be used in ministry to win the whole wide world for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Those who were held captive by Satan until that time. In paradise, under the earth, until Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. He liberated them. Amen. And we need to stand fast in the liberty wherein Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, the Bible says. Hallelujah. No longer is death the final statement. Death is just an incident in the Christian's life. It's but for a moment, and now there's no fear of death in our lives. Amen. Can you honestly say that? Dear God, absent from the body means present with the Lord, and that's where I want to be anyway. Amen. I'm ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been praying. I've been seeking. I've been trying to get my heart and life ready, dear God, washed in the blood, purged by God, and thank God that he's helping us with trials and afflictions that have come upon the whole earth to purge and ready his church and to get us ready for the coming of the Lord. The bride hath made herself ready. Are you ready at home today? Are you trusting in Jesus today? Amen. It's so key that we follow after Christ and we follow after him with all of our hearts. Amen. Praise God. <clears throat> I said it before, if you don't believe in the resurrection, you probably don't believe what the Bible teaches about the rapture. And I hope some people are listening to me at home because I'm going to talk to you about it. I want you guys to go in your Bibles this morning. And if you have a Bible, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Amen. Because the Bible teaches that God raised Jesus from the dead. I said the Bible teaches <laughs> that God raised Jesus from the dead. He also teaches that the church is going to be raised up. Amen. Now, who was, given this, who was given this doctrine? I'll tell you what, the Apostle Paul was given this doctrine. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, look at this. The same power raised Jesus from the dead is going to quicken us. It says here in 1 Corinthians 4, 13. Here we go. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that's the church, concerning them which are asleep. Let's talk about your lost loved ones or, or your loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord. Amen. 
that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Church, we have hope, amen? This is not a hope-so salvation. This is a no-so salvation. I know that my Redeemer lives, amen? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you see how it's pressed into the resurrection of the Lord? Look at that up there. It's, it's, it's right into the, to the resurrection. If we believe Jesus died and he rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus, wow, sleeping in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto, everybody say this, the coming of the Lord. Amen shall not prevent them which are already sleeping. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. They'll have the preeminence. Then we which are alive and remain shall be, everybody say, caught up, caught up, caught up, just like that. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds. Wow. To meet the Lord where? In the air. Do you get that? We're going to be caught up in the clouds. We're going to be going where he's at in the air. That's what the Bible says very specifically. And so shall we ever be with the Lord from that moment on. Amen. And then the next, I love 18 because it says, wherefore, comfort yourself. Everybody just give yourself a warm hug. (laughs) Okay, just put your arms around. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I want you guys to know that it's a comforting thing with hope because we have hope in Jesus. We have hope in the coming of the Lord. Amen. It's not a terrifying thing to me. I believe that we're going to be caught up and caught out. Amen. And if you can't believe in the, re- in the resurrection, you have a trouble believing in the rapture. But I want to tell you this is going to happen. Now, please listen to me and listen to me closely. I'm going to do a little teaching here. Okay. <clears throat> Death is separation of the soul from the body, right? That's what death is. Your soul leaves the body. It goes into one of two places, right? We believe that. In the book of Revelation chapter 20, it talks about the second death. Now, you guys have a first death, and everybody, everybody that's ever sinned dies, right? But there's a second death that happens in, in the book of uh, Revelation, and I, it, it happens where... Uh, it, it happens where there's... The second death is for people who are lost and who are going into eternity. Now listen to this. What does this mean? What's the second death mean? You die the first time, and that is when your soul leaves your body, but there is a second death, and and it's when you are separated not just from your body, but you're separated from God for eternity. That's the second death. And that's when hell is actually picked up and thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death. It's when Jesus says, depart from me. Depart from me in the, in the judgment of the great white throne. Now, here's the key, and I want you guys to get this. If you've only been born one time, you have to die twice. Think about this. If you've been born one time, a natural birth, you've got to die physically and then eternally. Eternal death is called the second death, right? Right? I'm gonna, I want you guys to get it. But if you're born a second time, meaning your natural birth wasn't good enough and you had to be born again, amen? You had to be born again. Then you only die one time and death has no sting, amen? Not at all because Jesus already took death, amen? He's overcome, <laughs> overcome hell and the grave and it's just a promotion for us, praise God. When you've been born again, you only die one time. Your soul leaves your body and you go to be with the Lord because that's what Jesus did for you at the cross. He beat death, he beat hell, and he beat the grave. Amen? Praise God for that. We don't have to. We know that there's gonna be a resurrection. We know that there's gonna be a reunion with my grandpa, somebody I looked up to in, in, this, in this life, my grandpa, Trimble. I can't wait to see him. He was a man of God. I didn't get enough time to talk to him in this life. He passed away when I was a senior in high school. He went to a lot of my football games my senior year. I can still remember him coming across the field at North Bend when we played North Bend, and I had like 18 tackles. I led the, led, I led the school in tackles that night, and he said, boy, Aaron, you, you played a great game. He said, all I heard on that, uh, over that loudspeaker was tremble, tremble, tremble. You made me so proud. Man, to hear him say that to me, I would have I done anything. You know, I would have enlisted in the Marine Corps. He was a Marine. 
And I tell you what, you just do anything for the people that you love. But I miss my grandma. I miss my grandma Stukenschmidt. I miss, I miss people that have gone on before. I've done funerals and I'm missing people. You know, I'm missing lovely people, but not for too long. <laughs> not for too long because this wonderful reunion is about to come home. And just think about it. Even before we meet the Lord in the air, we're, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we, which are alive, shall be caught up together with them. We're going to join hands probably with the deceased before we meet. Meet Jesus in the air. You think about that. All the people that have ever gone on that you loved and that were a part of your life, you're going to be reunited with them before meeting Jesus in the air, and so shall you ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That's good news today. Only possible by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Praise God. I want to talk th- real quickly this morning. He did three things when he died and rose again. He did three things when he died and rose again. Here's the three things we're going to talk about. He removed your transgressions. He said that he'll remember your sins no more. He releases you from your iniquities. I want to talk about two things, two words that that are both biblical words. One is an iniquity. Everybody say iniquity. The other one is a transgression. Okay, a transgression. Now, you think maybe these are the same thing, but they're not. An iniquity is something that goes down deep inside of you. An iniquity is something that is, is, is your hell bent. It's what your besetting sin would come from, okay? It's the thing that you're, you have uh, the greatest uh, <clears throat> pull towards or a weakness in your flesh, right? It's the iniquity. Maybe a generational. Maybe it's come, maybe it's come there's a weakness in your family, and it just comes through the sin nature of, of, of Adam, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we do believe that there are generational th- sins that are coming through called iniquities that come right through your family. I also believe that they're stopped by the blood of Jesus. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> and set free from that moment on, Amen. But I just want you guys, these iniquities, what Jesus was doing on the cross was dealing with our iniquities once and for all. Now, the next word I want to talk to you guys about is this word, and it's called transgression. Now, do you guys know what transgression is? Transgression, I'll tell you, thanks for asking. Uh, Transgression is the action. It's like the hand. It's like, it's like, okay, I'm thinking about it in my heart and in my mind. I'm thinking about doing this sin or I'm, I'm being tempted. But it's one thing to think it and, and have it never uh, materialize, but it's another thing then when temptation overcomes you and Satan overcomes you and then you actually go to do that thing. So the transgression would be, it, it's a trespass against the truth and against the word and against the law. And it's a, it's a moving, it's your hand moving in the area and actually doing the sin. So that's the difference. Any questions between iniquity and trespass? Two different things completely. But I want to show you guys this morning who dealt a death blow to both of them. Amen? Praise God. Let's see if we can pick up here. <clears throat> so an iniquity is an attitude. Okay, it comes from deep in the heart. A transgression is an action. You got it? You got it? I'm going to make sure you get it. Now, the Pharisees, Jesus, now the Pharisees, they had, anybody love religion? No. I don't love religion either, but the Pharisees, they're so good at religion. They would pay tithe and, uh, on mint and come and they would fast. They would make, go, go all over the world to make one proselyte, the Bible says, to make one conversion. They would do everything. They were so prim and proper and holy and no, they weren't. Because Jesus looked at him and John the Baptist both looked at him. He said, you're a den of vipers. You're a bunch of thieves. You're whited sepulchers. He had strong words for the Pharisees, right? These religious folks that thought that they had it all together and they didn't because Jesus, when he would deal with them, they wanted to grab a woman that was caught in adultery and everybody would just pick up a stone and get after her and come on, she was caught in in adultery. Let's kill her now. And Jesus would just draw a line in the sand or he'd do something else. And he said, he that, was, that is without sin cast the first stone, right? He was looking at their, not their transgressions because they were prim and proper and, and crafty enough to not get caught in their sins, right? But he was looking deeper into their iniquities. You see, the iniquity is what's on the inside, right? Transgression is outward, right? Oh, I got caught, I'm in trouble, whatever. Iniquity is what's inside of you, the sin nature, And he said, he even told them, you guys haven't transgressed that sin, but if you even look on a woman with lust, you have already committed adultery in your heart with her. Did he not say that? There he's dealing with the iniquity and not the transgression. 
Amen. So I want you guys to know every single person that Jesus is interested in delivering you from your iniquities. Amen. He's interested in dealing with your transgressions. Amen. Once and for all. And we're going to go and look in the Bible this morning. And if you guys would go with me <clears throat> as we look at some of these uh, in a greater way, we're going to end up at Isaiah 53, 5. Now, a lot of you guys, you guys think that, dear Lord, you know, these Pharisees, these Pharisees, these people, they they were just ugly. They were mean. They were just like religion is today. You know that? Ugly and mean. They were bitter and they were hateful. And they, they, but, but Jesus is looking inside of everybody today. He's looking inside of us all. He, and, and church, God knows if you're bitter inside. Jesus knows if you have bitterness in your heart or if you have unforgiveness in your heart or if you just can't, can't stand to be around people. You can't stand to be with people that are, that are Christian. You know what the Bible says? Jesus is dealing with the iniquity in, in somebody. He's saying this. He says, you're a murderer. He said that in the book of John. He said that you're a murderer. Wow. If you hate your brother, did you know the book of John says that you're a murderer and you have no life, light in you? Inside, you're so bitter. There's hatred. But Jesus wants to get at the iniquity. Amen. Jesus wants to release and he wants to reverse that curse. And Jesus is so powerful. He's the only one that has the power to turn your life around. He's the only one that can turn the world upside down. Amen. He's the only one that can change time and eternity. B.C. to A.D. He's the only basis, the creator God, the God Almighty. Amen. Hallelujah. The great I am. He's the one that can turn your life and change this thing. He's the one with the power of the blood that was sinless and holy. Look at this. He dealt with it in Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, 5. Everybody there say amen. It says that he was wounded. You see it? What is a wound? (laughs) He was wounded for our transgressions. I want you guys to key on two words. He was wounded. Wounded. For our transgressions. There's transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. Wounds and bruises. What's a wound? A wound, listen to this, a wound is outward bleeding. Any of you ever been cut? Any of you guys, my little girl, she was running in the sanctuary just the other day and she she tripped and she she skidded. Little Christian, of course, (laughs) she skidded and boy, she's got just just the carpet burns on her little face, her pretty little face. And you can see that the the blood came up and she's got wounds on her face. She's got a Band-Aid over here. She's gonna be all right say prayers for her, but there was a wound there, right? Wounded is outward bleeding. You know what a bruise is? Bruise is when you've been, uh, when Clinton's been popped back in the day or when he got in these fights and and he, he he was going toe to toe with somebody and he dropped them all, I'm just sure of it. And he left them with bruises. Now bruises is internal bleeding. Internal bleeding. Have you ever seen? Have you ever had a black and blue mark on your eye or your face or your hand or what? I think I broke all my fingers a few times in, in football and nose and everything else. It's just black and blue. That's an internal thing. And the Bible says here, as we look at it, he was wounded. He was wounded for our outward actions. That's what that means. In fact, the stripes that were laid on his back. The blood that was outwardly shown in his life. Now listen to me, you guys. This is great. All of those things. All of those things that he endured at the cross. The wounds. The bloodshed. The whipping. The scourging. Somebody said that he he had 468 lashes before he even got done with the Roman guard. I read in the book of Luke where they they put a sack over his head and they beat him in the head. They swung a club, and they, they, were, they, were, they were asking, who, oh, come on, prophet, who, who just hit you? I'd never seen that before. It just jumped out at me the other day when I'm reading the book of Luke. They tormented our God. They tormented the God of creation, the one that made everything, the one that gave humans their breath, the one that created a tree, the one that created the grass and the hills and the mountains and the valleys and everything beauty, beautiful about this world. They beat the creator God. He was wounded for our outward actions. Think about your past and the sin, your sin nature and what you did in this. He's, he's, he paid for that at, the, at Calvary. 
Wound, it, it's chalu. It means it, to bore or slay or pierce. And it refers to his hands and his feet and his side being, being, being placed upon that cross. If you're wounded, you have outward bleeding and transgressions and outward act of sin. And this action is the scene at the cross and before the cross from Gethsemane right onto the cross. Jesus was wounded. He poured out his life's blood. God's blood ran red for you. And this lamb that was slain, the sacrifice was smitten. The Bible says he was cut off, stricken in his body for our outward transgressions. 1 Peter 2.24 says, by whose stripes we are healed. Him himself bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Hallelujah, that we being dead to sins. That, that word goes on and it talks about Messiah's stripes, the stripes, the stripes. By the stripes, this is what that means. A black and blue mark. A stripe, bruises, hurt, blueness of the wounds and spots Christ could have received 468 stripes. My God. In Psalm 22, in Psalm 22, we looked at it on Wednesday night. He said, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's, it's melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaves to my jaws and, and, and they've pierced my hands and feet. He was bruised, church. Jesus Christ was bruised. And what was in the bruising? What was bruising? It's internal bleeding, right? Internal bleeding. Think about this. Jesus was bleeding for you on the inside. He was bleeding for you on the outside. He was going through it, the cross for you and for his father. Inside and outside motivation. His bruise, the bru bruise is daka. It means to crumble, to beat to pieces, to break, to bruise, to crush, to destroy. And there's the scourging and then there's the thorns and then there was the physical sufferings. Every single thing was for the atonement of, of our soul. Amen. We cannot take it lightly this morning on resurrection morning. It was also for our physical healing. Amen. It was also for our physical healing. What, what does this come down to? It comes down to this, that he completely cleansed you inside of all the iniquities, outside of all the transgressions, inside and outside, inside and outside. This purifying work, this substitution, this atoning work by the blood of Jesus, by the power of God Almighty is here to set us free. Amen. Christ, Christ's righteousness is a perfect gift for every single one of us. It makes us justified, which means just as if I never sinned at all. It also means just as if I had never even been around sin, just as if I've, if I've never thought, just as if I had done everything right. My Lord and Savior, just as if I did everything right. It, his righteousness, not having my own righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but a righteousness which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. He sanctified us and became our sanctification. He, was, he, he made us perfect by one sacrifice. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. He's made perfect people in this room. Stand to your feet this morning. I want to tell you that what God stands up right here is perfect in God's eyes. Amen. Hallelujah. You get a hold of that today. Even at home, wherever you're at, stand up and say, dear God, thank you, Jesus, for you have made me perfect in the eyes and the heart of an almighty God as he looks down. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You can be seated in this place, made perfect. You've been accepted. Hallelujah. In the beloved by the, by the Lord Jesus, Ephesians 1.6. Colossians 2.13, God has made you alive with Christ. He has forgiven all of your sins. Amen. And one of the great, great scriptures, Colossians 2.10, I love this. It says, and you are complete. I've looked all my life for something to complete me. You know, the old, that, that the movie came out long ago, oh, you complete me. There ain't nothing that completes us. The only thing that completes us is Jesus Christ and having Christ come in and totally take over and totally take the purchased possession, the redeemed, amen, hallelujah, praise the name of Jesus. We're united and joined with Christ. You know, Watchman Nee, <clears throat> he, he put it this way. He said, you know, you can put a letter, you can put a letter 
You can put a letter or something like that in a book like this. He says you can close, you can put that letter right in there. And you can close that book up. And then you can take that book and you can burn that. And whatever happened to the book, you could, I tell you what, you could put this book on the cross. You could bury this book. And you could, you could let this book raise up again. Amen? But whatever is in that book, you could burn it, tear it up, whatever happened to that through identification. What happened with Jesus Christ, if your name is in this book of life, it happened to you too. I don't think you heard me. Whatever happened to, whatever, whatever was placed into this book, your life, your faith and your trust in this book, amen? Whatever happens to this book, whatever happens to this book happened to you. Jesus' death, that means I died, amen? Jesus' burial, that means I, I, I've been buried with Jesus Christ, amen? My identification with Jesus Jesus raised from the dead. That means I've been raised from the dead to newness of life. Amen. And I'm in this. You, can, you could do anything to this body, and they did everything to Christ's body to destroy it. But up from the grave it arose. Amen. And it's alive today. It's alive today in the power and in the love of grace and power and mercy of God. It's alive today, and this book is on fire today. And dear God, I want to have my name written in the Lamb's book of life, not only now, but forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, crucified, dead, buried, raised, and ascended. Not just raised, but ascended. That means we're going to be caught up with him. Amen? And so shall we ever be with the Lord, and that's a good news. Wherefore, comfort yourselves with these words. I can't get over this scripture, Isaiah 53.10. Isaiah 53.10. Stephanie, I had a hard time with this one. I honestly did. I had a hard time with this scripture. I read this probably the first, th first few times that I went through, Brother Joe. And I tell you what, I had a hard time with this verse because it says, look at that. It says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The only begotten, the darling of God. That beautiful, beautiful little baby boy that came in perfectly and sinlessly. And yet God said, it pleased the Lord, God, to bruise his son. You got a little boy, Carlos? I got a little boy. My gosh, can you imagine putting your, your son upon that altar? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. And he hath put him to grief. That word grief means sickness. And that word means that he, that the, the sicknesses of this world have come, went upon him at the cross. Nobody realizes this, but think about, think about Jesus didn't have cancer. Jesus didn't have AIDS. Jesus didn't have, Jesus didn't have any, any kind of a disease ever once in his life. Do you, do you agree with me on that? But it says right there that he hath put him to grief. He hath allowed those things to come upon him like a magnet at the cross. Can you imagine what he went through? as the sin of, of every sin, every diabolical sin that could ever be thought or done through transgression, amen, through iniquity and transgression from the human heart was placed upon him like a cesspool of hell itself. It was laid upon him. All the diseases that would ever kill a man and, and, and he compounded by the billions of souls, amen, was placed upon him. And he had to drink the bitter cup. He had to drink that cup and he had to swallow down the dregs of it. And it was so sinful that the wrath of God had to be poured out upon Jesus as he was on the cross dealing with our sins. Jesus had to pour the fire of his wrath against, and Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Dear Lord, think about what he did for you and me. I just want to say, oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he do? This is why it pleased him. It pleased God to permit him to be crucified was to bring about redemption of the whole creation so that his eternal program could be carried on so that, that, that father and son both volunteered in this. And there's scripture that says Jesus wouldn't even give up the ghost until he said it was done. It was finished. Amen. He accomplished this for us. Amen. He said, then I'm going to give up. I'll give my body now. I'm hanging on to it. Nobody takes my life away. Amen. The Bible says when they came to get him, they came to get him that he could have called 12 legions of angels. I had to look back at that again. Study it again. 
12 legions of angels. Some people, some commentators say that's 80,000, 80,000 angels could have come and he could have just blown and obliterated all those, all those soldiers from Rome. My God, but he went willingly to cleanse us inside and to cleanse us outside. I want to ask you this morning, how near to God has Jesus brought the believer? How near to God has Jesus brought the believer? How near are you to God today? The answer is in Scripture. You are as near to God as Christ is himself. You get your head around that. Our position, positionally, just as, the, just, just as close as the Father is to the Son at this very moment. How close are they? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. God could reach out and touch Jesus. Jesus could reach out and touch him. That's how close you are to your God today. Amen. Hallelujah, because we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He hath reconciled us to God. We've been redeemed. We've been brought near. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Then you've been given access by one spirit to the Father. Ephesians 2.18. Thank God for the liberty that we have in God to boldly come into the throne room and ask our Abba Father anything that we need in this hour. Amen. And he says, boldly come in and obtain, and I'm going to give to you what you need. I will give this. I'm ready to give whatever you ask in my name and by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. He'll give it to us. Praise God. Can you catch it? Amen. Amen. (laughs) Praise the name of Jesus. What a opportunity to have gifts given through the blood of his son to be cleansed inside and out. Secondly, I want to just bring this, and maybe this is more remarkable than anything you've ever heard this morning. But in Isaiah 43, verse 25, if we could pull that up today, Isaiah 43, 25. I love this. Praise God. 43, 25 in your Bibles at home. It says, I'll, I'll look over here for a second by Mary. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. That's the outward, right? I'm dealing with all that. I'm blotting them out. I'm wiping them off. I'm wiping the slate clean. I'm getting rid of them for my sake, for my sake. And will not remember thy sins. (laughs) Are you serious? Are you serious? He's blotting out my transgressions, every physical act that I've done with my hand, everything that I've ever thought in my heart. He's dealt with my iniquities, the deepest thought of this heart. He's blotted out. He's canceled. He's canceled out the charge. The debt has been paid. Amen. Jesus dropped the charges. Amen. And according to to this commentary, I got to read this. When this is done, no punishment can be exacted for your sins and the people are forgiven, must be treated as pardoned friends. As pardoned friends. Oh my Lord, that's good. Hebrews 8, 12, it gets better. It gets better. It gets better. How long have I been preaching? Come on. (laughs) Hebrews 8, 12. Look at this, you guys. This is your God. And this is a God of resurrection, by the way, a God that's faced hell, death in the grave, a God that's gone to the bowels of the earth to free up and lead captivity captive and free every single person in paradise, everybody in gridlock. He has slapped the devil in the face. He, look at this form. I love this. You know what Jesus, even, even Jesus is standing on the cross. Amen. He was putting his, he's putting his heel on the devil. You got that? Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3, where it says that you're going to bruise his heel. You guys don't get it. Jesus was just jumping up and getting ready to pounce on that serpent. Boom. You got it? 
That's what Jesus did. And his headache is going on and on. It's going to go on for, into hell, and it's going to go on in the lake of fire forever. Satan, you are a defeated foe by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You have no power and authority where the blood has been applied. Amen. And we are children of the King today. Amen. We have kingdom rights and privileges because Christ is on the throne. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. He's our God today. Amen. We can be encouraged in that today. Hallelujah. And you need to know that. Hallelujah today. Christ is alive. Look at this. He says, I will be merciful. Hebrews 8, 12. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. Sins and iniquities, transgressions and iniquities will I remember no more. Amen. New Testament style. Praise the name of Jesus. This is phenomenal. He won't recall or bring up anything against us that has been covered by the precious blood. He will not bring up and, and recall anything that you have ever done because you've been justified by the power and the, of grace in God. Church, I don't think any one of us have a concept of what Jesus Christ has done. And then he said, <clears throat> he says, I will remember. <clears throat> I will remember no more. I will remember your sins no more. He doesn't forget them. I don't believe he forgets anything. But he does this consciously. He says, I will remember them no more. They're as good as done. It's as good as over. Hallelujah. They're blotted out. Do you get that? Turn to somebody at home or in this room and say, God has removed your transgressions and he remembers your sin no more. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. It ought to make you a worshiper. Ought to make you want to worship Jesus, brother. I'm telling you, man, it ought to make us just want to sing and dance and get happy, run around this place, kill the fatted calf, amen, start to fellowship with all of our brothers, black, white, yellow, brown, South African. I don't care where you're from, amen. Jesus doesn't either. It's just where you're going, amen. Hallelujah. He's called us from all around the world to be a, 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 a city on a hill. Praise God for that. He releases us from our iniquities by the power of the shed blood. I want to tell you guys this, that the life of the flesh was in the blood. Amen. According to Leviticus, the life of your flesh right now. Go ahead and pinch yourself. Go ahead. Pinch it. Pinch it. Pinch yourself. Punch yourself. Whatever. Don't leave a bruise. <clears throat> the life of your flesh. The moment that blood stops circulating in your body, you're done. The life of the flesh was in the blood. And it says in that, it says in that Isaiah passage that he poured his self out. He poured his life's blood out. The blood of Jesus is going out. It's, it, it's exploding out. Oh, my God. You know, some people believe, I, I didn't know if I was going to talk about this or not, Joe. You've seen it with me. Some people believe they found the Ark of the Covenant. They did tests, swabs of the mercy seat where they believe the blood of Jesus who was on Calvary, uh, and it says the rocks were rent, and there was an earthquake while well, Jesus was actually on the cross. You know, what a, you know what a railroad tie will do when it's doing this? It'll rent the rocks underneath it. There was an earthquake at Calvary that day. They believe the blood that was poured out went down underneath Golgotha into the place of the skull, okay? And it went down into Jeremiah's grotto where the... Uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant was laid. Ark of the Covenant was laid. They believe some of that blood had gotten on to the mercy seat. So the actual blood of Jesus went to the actual Ark of the Covenant. They did a swab on, on that. They took it to laboratories in Israel, and they said, this, they started to mix it with a saline solution. And they said, there's something different about this blood. This, this, blood, this blood is different. They said, they said, this blood is not dead blood. This blood is still alive. It start, this blood is still alive, church. And whether that's true or not, I want you guys to know the blood of Jesus is still alive. And they, they tested the chromosomes. They said this, this, I forget how that works, but the chromosomes on this blood, it shows that this had an earthly mother, but it had one chromosome for the father. That this, fa this has no earthly, no earthly father at all. And the blood of Jesus is still alive at this very moment. Amen.
The blood of Jesus is still alive to heal. The blood of Jesus still is his power. My God, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The blood of Jesus is still alive today. Amen. The blood of Jesus will come into your house, your home, your marriage, your life. Amen. The blood of Jesus will come and bring victory to your world. Amen. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus will usher in a new era. Hallelujah. It'll bring in, hallelujah, Lord Jesus, the new Jerusalem to this earth where Christ is on the throne forever and ever and ever. The blood of Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your life, Lord Jesus. Your DNA and your power was in that blood, and it's still reaching to every single person, telling us that we must be born again, telling us that we are the sons of God and encouraging us today, amen, telling us that we're new creations in Christ when Christ has come in, amen, that we've been adopted, amen, hallelujah, that we've been made heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus, and my God, we're no longer slaves, the Bible says, but now we're friends. We're friends. And we're close to God because Jesus can reach out and touch God and God can reach out and touch Jesus. Wow. Through the cross of Jesus, everything that was opposed and against you has been nailed to the cross. Everything. The law was nailed. Everything that you tried to do in your own, in your own works, it was all nailed. And now we just simply come I want to read Colossians 2.12 this morning before we close. It says, buried with him in baptisms. Now look at this. Wherein also ye are risen. You are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Oh, church, dear God, would you pour into the people here and pour into the people there and everywhere to know that they've been risen. They are risen just as sure as Jesus Christ was risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christian church, you guys are risen. You've been risen with Jesus Christ. And my question as we close today, What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with this wonderful Jesus? What are you going to do with him? He's done everything for you. He's done everything for us. Are you going to choose two deaths for your life? A natural death where you go and after that the judgment? Which, which judgment are you going to be at? The judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne where you experience the second death as hell is cast into the lake of fire? And Jesus would say to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that worketh iniquity. Don't let that be your story today. This word has come to envelope you. You open this up, it talks about a red sea. Every single person out there, you need to part the waters of this Red Sea, this book. Amen. Part the waters and go through. Go through on a journey of faith that'll save your soul forever, ever, ever. I don't want to die twice. I've already died to the old man. Now my death is simply placing me in the arms of my Savior. As Stephen, as Jesus stood up when Stephen was being stoned. And he was ready and willing to just take him into his arms. Wow, think about that. Now listen, I believe we're in the end times. Anybody else believe that? I believe it's very possible. I tell my girls this all the time. I don't think I'm going to (laughs) die. Which is music to their ears. (laughs) I tell them all the time, we're going to be, we're flying. They said, do we have wings in heaven? (laughs) <laughs> I said, I'm sure we have wings in heaven. There's no doubt. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's going to be all kinds of stuff in heaven. You know that? All kinds of stuff. But it's going to be great there because Jesus is there. Amen. We get to worship him. And, and I'm so glad that he's given me a little bit of wanting to be a worshiper right here. Right here on earth. Right here. 1140 North Lincoln Street or wherever God places me or you. Amen. We can worship God right where we're at and become the worshipers of God. 
Praise God. God wants that for you. As I close the second time, I just want to say this. This is resurrection morning. It's resurrection morning. And I want to ask you this. How many do you think we have left? Do you think we have another year? Do you think we have another Easter a year from now? Could very well be. I don't know, but I just believe if you're listening, you need to make a decision because t- the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Amen. Behold, now is the acceptable time. It says today, if you hear his heart, hear, hear his heart, harden not your heart. If you hear his word, harden not your heart. Jesus wants you to know this. He wants you, and this is what Jesus wants to do for you right now, okay? He wants to remove your transgressions. He wants to never remember them again and never bring them up or allow them to be brought up to you to be used against you again. How do you like that? He wants to release you. Listen to this, church. He wants to release you from addictions, from the tendencies of transgressions, from deep iniquities and from the weaknesses of your flesh towards sin, he was bruised for these things. He went and took the stripes to free you from these things. Are you getting me? To give you a complete victory over every ounce of struggle in your life, amen? He knows that we're gonna struggle. Do you think you have to be perfect before you can get to heaven? You're laughing. You do. There's nothing but perfection can come into heaven. But there was one that was. There is one perfect. If there was any other way, God would have, God would have taken this cup off Jesus. But because there was no other way, God sent the sinless perfect one to die. And when God looks down, he sees, he sees Jesus. And heaven will be heaven because Jesus is there. Heaven is heaven right now because Jesus is here. And I ask you, the, the, the audience at home, is Jesus here? Do you know him? Do you know what he wants to do? Did you know that Jesus is the mercy seat? Jesus shed the blood. Amen. He wants you today to know he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. And by his stripes, we are healed. Your family, your future, your life. When I gave my heart to Jesus, I did it for three reasons. I needed a real friend. A real friend. Because I had tons of people around me. But I needed a real friend. I was lonely. I needed forgiveness because I knew I was a sinner. Partying from Thursday through Sunday and throughout the week and living a vain life. Number three, I wanted the future that he promised and I needed it desperately. And I realized that my life was going to burn out the way that I was living. Jesus gave me all three. He gave me a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. He gave me forgiveness and no one else could do that. And he has given me a future, Brendan, a future like no other. He's given me an eternal future. Oh my God. And it's so close. I can taste it. And I want to go there to be with him. Hallelujah. He became my best friend. I want to ask you out there. Is he your best friend? Is he your best friend today? He can give you total forgiveness. He can give you a great future. Jeremiah 29 shares his heart. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. That word expected means hoped for. I want to give you the end that you hope for. Let's let let that be in Jesus today. And while you're at home and in your homes right now, I believe God is calling you home. He's just calling you home. He's ready for you to come. And I pray that, I pray that there's a, 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 a young person out there that's watching right now. And you're, you're hearing your pastor one more time preach the gospel. 
and you're coming to Christ this morning because he loves you. He's not coming to judge you. Right now, he's coming to give you mercy. Amen. What a wonderful God. He's resurrected King of Kings. He's got a message of mercy for the whole wide world. And right now, <clears throat> let's bow our heads in this room and let's bow our heads at home. Father God, Father God, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I just pray, Father God, if there's people that are in the homes or see this throughout the week, Lord God, that they would realize, Lord Jesus, there's a great, great friend to have in Christ. Father God, that, that, that we can give all, all, everything to him, Lord Jesus, and expect everything in return. Father God, this morning by faith in Jesus, help us to just, for, help us to just know you Father God, if there's people out there, Father God, that, that, that are, are lost this morning, God, go to them right now. As everybody in this church is praying and whoever's going to see this, Father God, help us to repent. Help us to believe. Help us to accept you, Father God. Help, Lord Jesus, us to accept the fact that we are sinners, Lord Jesus, and our sin has separated us. But Father God, your blood comes in, Lord Jesus. And as we believe in the power of that blood and as we repent of our sins, Father God, we confess our sins, Lord Jesus. Father God, unto you, Father God, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, would you touch that heart, Lord God, that you're touching right now? And would you birth them into the kingdom of God? Would you do it now and forever, we ask it, this Easter morning, in Jesus' name. Amen.